Story Hinge, Episode 71, Nate Dern. Story, comedy. Um, so don't do the thing that you think other people want to do. Do what you want to do and do it as well as you can. And other people will will recognize that and they'll want to help you succeed. Um, I think a thing that you'll hear stand-ups recommend, and this is true, is just to be confident. Even if you're bombing, you kind of fake it because if the audience, if the audience senses that you're nervous, it makes them nervous. And then instead of, instead of being able to enjoy the jokes, they're just worried about you because it doesn't, they're not necessarily even like bad people heckling. It's just like the human empathy reaction to be like, oh gosh, that person looks nervous up there. I hope they're okay. So it's not the mindset you want the audience to be in. It's not a mindset that is conducive to laughing. Yeah, it puts them at ease. And then they're at least in the frame of mind where they could laugh. Welcome to Story Hinge. At Story Hinge, we explore foundational ideas and beliefs. We believe everyone has a beautiful story to grow. Now here's your host, Jason Badari. All right, welcome everyone to Story Hinge. Today we have on someone who is a writer, an actor, a director involved in comedy and has written the book, Not Quite a Genius. Today's guest is Nate Dern. Looking forward to talking to Nate Dern about story, about comedy, and about his work. So with all that, Nate, welcome to Story Hinge. Hello, thanks for having me on the program. Yeah, I'm really excited to talk to you. I'm in this area of exploring stories and in all their different formats and and seeing where that goes. So I know you're, I see you as a very creative doing writing and directing and acting. And so I'm looking forward to hearing some of that. But when we first get a little a background on you and hear a little bit about your, you know, a little, the, the 30,000 foot view, if you would, of who, yeah. who, who, Nate, who Nate Dern is. Yeah, well, so I grew up in Evergreen, Colorado. And at that time, I thought that I wanted to get into politics and maybe go to law school because I did um, I did student government. Um, but what it took me a while to realize was that my favorite part of student government was doing the assemblies where we would do like a silly skit or something like that. So once I got to college, I started doing improv comedy. And at first, it started as just something I did on the side. And I still initially thought I was going to get into politics and go to law school and all that. But then I slowly realized that that was my favorite thing to do and what I truly had a passion for. So that led to doing stand-up comedy and then writing as well and then making short films just on my own uh, and kind of just eventually decided I was going to try to do comedy and have that be my job in some capacity, you know, either acting or writing or directing or anything. Um, so I moved to New York City uh, to take classes at the Upright Citizens Brigade Theater, which is an improv and sketch comedy theater. And I chose to go there just because some people, uh, some alumni from that theater, like Amy Poehler, who was also one of the founders, or Bobby Moynihan, had gone on to Saturday Night Live. And so that seemed like, OK, there's they're doing something right here if they're having some success. So I went there to take classes and to try to get my foot in the door. And um, I eventually got onto a house team there and then became a teacher there. And then I became the artistic director. So I was running the theater in New York City for a few years. And then after that, I had um, an opportunity to apply to a writing job at Funny or Die. Uh, so I wrote for Funny or Die, the comedy website, for another about three and a half years. Uh, and that just concluded um, about a month ago when they um, – a part of a digital sector crunch, uh, as they called it, they shut down their in-house editorial department. So they let go of all their writers. Um, hmm. So that brings me up to the present present day. Okay. So what was it back, you know, when you started down this path about comedy or what changed or how did you know that that's something you wanted to do? Yeah, well, I, I always loved, you know, just story and narrative. So I loved reading books. From the time when I was really young, you know, especially loved sci-fi and fantasy. Uh, Kurt Vonnegut was my first favorite author. And then later really loved like Philip K. Dick. And then these days, like George Saunders is my favorite author. So that, I think, is what first had my love for it. And then I just saw comedy as one avenue 
that I, you know, perhaps my skill set was a little bit better suited for comedy storytelling rather than, say, dramatic storytelling. Um, and then just my sensibility seemed to line up with other comedians. Uh, like when I started to go to college, the, the improv comedians and the stand-up comedians, we just seemed to kind of see the world in a similar way. Um, and I admired the more serious theater people or the more dramatic storytellers or writers or English majors or whatever, but they just kind of had a different sensibility than I had. So it's sort of like self-selecting, like, okay, I think this is my tribe that I found, these other comedians. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. And what it, what is it about the story, or what what have you learned about story through this time that that you've been able to to, to carry through your career? Yeah, I think I've, I think entertainment in general, and then story specifically, on a very basic level, storytelling is just about holding someone's attention, uh, and there's a variety of ways you can do that. Uh, one is just through, you know, a type of mystery or even less subtle than mystery is just to have the listener or the reader or the viewer want to know what's going to happen next. Um, and you can do that just by having an interesting character or being funny enough that you keep uh, heightening the humor in surprising ways uh, where you think that you want to stay around to see what they do next. Um, so just through humor alone, like through sketch comedy, just by doing sillier and sillier things that are basically versions of the same joke, you can get away with that for, you know, three to five minutes, whatever the length of an SNL sketch is, a Saturday Night Live sketch, for example. More sustained storytelling, you, then you start to need more than just comedy, I think, to keep someone's interest. Then you need stakes or character development things like that. And that's when you start to get into, you know, like sitcoms or longer films or things like that. Well, you know, when I think of comedy or really, especially a comedian level, it seems there's so much storytelling within that. Right. But at the same time, I'm like, that's seems like the most difficult also to be humorous at the same time. Can you give us a sense of what that, what that has been like for you or how that has worked out for you? Yeah. It's, um, it, it can be difficult. I think like any craft, you just get better at it with time. And you also kind of – a thing that you'll hear stand-up comedians say specifically is that you just have to find your voice. Um, and usually that comes for a lot of people unless you're just like naturally gifted right away, which I was not. Uh, but anyway, for a lot of people, you it starts by imitating other people. So you kind of – you're like, well, I like this particular stand-up, so maybe I'll try his or her style. And you go to an open mic and not to say that you're stealing their jokes, but you're sort of like, OK, they kind of tell jokes in this rate, rhythm or this cadence and about these topics. And they do like this mix of personal stories to non sequiturs to one liners. And you're just kind of trying that out. And then the more and more you do it, you sort of figure out what comes naturally to you and what you can pull off. And you'll, you'll kind of start to realize how an audience receives you. Um, and so that does influence what you'll be able to get away with in terms of, uh, the particular strategies that you go for with your performing. Hmm. You know, you mentioned earlier that this, this concept, you kind of self-selected into, into this area. And to me, that sounds a little bit like you had to know about yourself and, and what, what was more preferential for you. Do you have any helps or hints on how we get to know ourselves that way and, and know yeah. what areas we fit in better? Yeah, good question. I think for me, what I'm specifically thinking of was actually more of like an epiphany moment where I thought that I, because in, in my school, in my high school, I was one of the more like serious academic types. Um, but then when I got to college, I, <laughs> you know, I, everything's relative. <laughs> And I realized, oh, wow, I, I'm not the same as these more like serious academic types who are studying economics and who want to, you know, like have the next 15 years planned out and they know what year they want to do this. So it wasn't it wasn't hard for me. It was just a very immediately like, oh, wow, I'm not like this. I do not have I do not share the same sensibility or outlook or values and not in like a judgmental way, not to say one is better than the other, just like. 
it was just very clear to me <laughs> that we were on a different wavelength. Uh, and so I guess the advice would be uh, is to try out a bunch of different groups uh, from a social standpoint or from a you know, career standpoint, if you're able to, to dabble in the sensibilities of different careers. And then for me, it was just obvious that the, the sensibility of the entertainment and then specifically comedian world just lined up with how I saw the world. So I guess it, it, the work was in trying a few different things. So, you know, maybe briefly thought that I wanted to do math and engineering because that's what my dad did. Uh, and then thinking I wanted to do law school because I, you know, something about politics appealed to me and getting in that way. So dabbling in those worlds uh, helped to then make it very clear once I found the world that did line up, that it was, it was a good fit. I guess in a way it's like dating <laughs> that you kind of, you know, you date different people and then you realize what's important to you or what's what you thought was important in a partner, but actually isn't as important as this other quality or this other sensibility lining up. And then eventually after you've had a few misses or partners, partners that didn't, that weren't good fits, then when you have a partner that is a good fit, it really is that much more obvious to you. Okay. That makes sense. You know, I actually have this idea. I've been kind of playing with different basically trying to, you know, go out outside of my comfort zone and try different things. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the, you know, through the podcast is part of that, but I've actually had the idea of trying to go do some stand up. You should. You should. Uh, yep. And yeah, any, any advice on that? How, how to prepare for that? How to do, go do it your first time or just go do it? What would you say? Yeah. I mean, just go do it. Um, I think be prepared. Uh, it might not go well and that's okay. It's not supposed <laughs> yeah. to go well your first time. It's like if you were about to, if you were going to try to run a marathon the first time that you went out and jogged one mile, it would hurt. That doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. That's that's how the training works. And then the next time you jog a mile, it hurts a little less, and then you just keep going. I think you know the same thing's true with stand up. I um, I did the first time I did stand up was with my just in like a college group, and I did okay. I, I was doing jokes about college for other college students. Mm. They knew the references. I had like jokes about professors, like inside jokes. I was like, oh, okay, I'm pretty good at this. I did that a few times. And then I went and did uh, what's called a bringer show. So to get um, an amount of time on like a real stand-up show at a club, you have to bring a certain number of audience members. So I, I had to bring two audience members or something like that. And then I had five minutes. And um, and I just bombed. Like even my friends didn't laugh because I think they were embarrassed that they came there with me. <laughs> Uh, and it was a wake up call, like, oh, wow, I, I don't know what I'm doing yet. Um, I think a, a thing that you'll hear stand ups recommend, and this is true, is just to be confident. Even if you're bombing, you kind of fake it because if the audience, if the audience senses that you're nervous, it makes them nervous. And then instead of, instead of being able to enjoy the jokes, they're just worried about you because it doesn't, they're not, they're not necessarily even like bad people heckling. It's just like the human empathy reaction to be like, Oh gosh, that person looks nervous up there. I hope they're okay. So it's not the mindset you want the audience to be in. <laughs> it's not a mindset that is conducive to laughing. So, uh, that's a great, yeah, it puts them at ease. And then they're at least in the frame of mind where they could laugh. Yeah, that makes sense. Even after you, you know, you start getting better and practicing, were there still times when you you went out there and just it just bombed, and you're like, man, I thought it was better than that. Absolutely, all the time. <laughs> like I, um, I just moved to LA a year ago from New York City, um, and these days I do less stand up and I do more improv comedy and sketch sketch comedy. Um, and moving to LA was kind of starting from square one with improv because I I didn't have my regular weekly show that I was doing anymore. So I was doing improv like with different people who I didn't know as well and like at different times that weren't the prime spots that didn't have as like big of audiences. And so this this whole past year actually has been a lot of like a, a reset of like, oh, wow, yeah, this this is hard when <laughs> it's hmm. a good um, a good ego check. Yeah, that sounds good. I mean, the furthest I ever did, I think in college one time, I went and tried out for a play, and I have no no skills, no no previous experience whatsoever. And, oh, that's great! And I remember I remember staff there reading my lines, and I was like, "Man, this is <laughs> this is rough." <laughs> that's that's great. You did it though. That's awesome. 
Is there, um, like, do you, as you work through this and, and, and grown in your career, are there certain themes or goals that you're trying to accomplish with your, with your work? Yeah. I mean, I have, I have some like, uh, very tangible, you know, achievement oriented goals that are things like, uh, get staffed to be a staff writer on a TV show, or, um, I've sold one book, which is a collection of essays and stories called not quite a genius, but I want to sell, um, I want to sell a novel next, uh, I want to sell a screenplay. So I have, I have like, uh, achievement oriented goals like that. But then I also just kind of the perpetual goal is just to keep, keep getting better and to keep, you know, reading and consuming other media that I like and to try to always be like a little bit better. And I guess it's still kind of like emulating the other things that I admire and trying to be a little bit more like that. And then hopefully incorporating that into my own, like, larger toolbox of what I'm able to do. Okay. You know, I just did watch one of your, your short films here, but I guess it's from your book about the girl who dies. Oh yeah. He, Thanks for watching. That was, <laughs> yeah, it was really good. Yeah. And, um, it was good on multiple levels. One is really funny. Thank you. So you're laughing at it. And then there's also a nice twist at the end that makes you really think, at least, at least it did for me. It was like, Oh, that's, that's something to think about. Oh, I appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for watching. So is your book made up of those type of stories or what is your book like? It's, it's quite a mishmash. Um, the, the New York times reviewed it and called it schizophrenic, but substantive. So I think the schizophrenic is because it's a mix of nonfiction, personal essays, but then also, um, com, you know, fictional stories like, which is the one that you were referring to called how many farts measure a life, which is about, a um, yeah, that's a, a fictional story. Uh, then there's also more just like, traditional humorous prose so that's like what you would find in like the new yorker shouts and murmurs section or mcsweeney's inter internet tendency um or like on a website like funny or die or college humor just articles um so it's a mix of all of that like um and so it kind of changes from piece to piece i think there's about 64 pieces total or something like that okay you know one thing i in in, in preparing to talk to you you know, usually I have a lot of material I go through with my guests. I try to go as much as I can, given the time that I have. And I guess some, one thing I still feel like with you, I don't, who is this Nate Dern? I mean, on a personal level, if I was hanging out with you, what would you be like? Because I see your work and I mean, I'm like, is this how he is all the time? Because that's out there sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, or what is he like normally? Yeah, well, I think I'm, good question. I think I'm more subdued normally, especially as I get older. Um, I used to, and I talk about this in the book, I used to be like pretty attention hungry, which I think is true for a lot of comedians or performers. Um, but maybe now because I have more outlets, like, you know, the occasional improv show or writing, um, I can kind of get my attention itch scratched that way. And then when I'm hanging out, I can be, you know, a bit more of an introvert and more, um, don't need to be the center of attention and don't even really like to be these days. Hmm. Okay. Um, you also have mentioned that there's another work you're involved in right now too. Something about an app or something that's going on. Let's hear about that. Yeah. So I've been working on this app, uh, with some collaborators for the last couple of years called new Q. And, uh, what, what it's all about, it's going to hopefully come out this summer. Um, it's available for beta preview uh, testing right now if you go to www.newq.com. Um, and the app is basically like our little way to try to combat fake news. Hmm. And how it works is by gamifying the news. And what we mean by that is that users make predictions about what's going to happen. Um, and they can be anything. They could be, you know, like who's going to win best picture at the Oscars or which sports team is going to win something. Or they can be more substantive and political, like will Trump sign the steel tariffs this week, something like that. But it just has to be a binary outcome, yes or no. Uh, and then we have other users make predictions, vote on those, um, vote on those, yes or no. And then we keep track of the outcome. So the, the idea is just to try to uh, have people focus again on reality, on facts, on what really happens. Um, and then we'll have scores for people. So we want to try to reward people 
uh, whether they be experts or just lay people who happen to pay attention to the news. Um, so you'll have an ongoing score in different categories and then, you know, you'll come to be rewarded for having your expertise. Okay. Okay. And I, do you, do you, people like get to know who you are at, within that or is it, you know, to see who's really good at it or who's not? Is that part of the game? Yeah, exactly. So you'd have a score and there'll be leaderboards. Um, so you, you might be, and we're going to have some actual experts join it. So we already have some journalists and political pundits. Uh, we have some professional athletes who have agreed to be a part of it. Um, comedians. Uh, so you'll be able to see like, oh, wow, I'm actually, I'm better at guessing politics overall than this other person is. Like my political score is higher than theirs. Um, or like, oh, wow, this professional poker player is actually pretty good at make, making guesses about sports. Uh, that makes sense that they've got uh, some sort of betting advantage there. Great. Well, we'll make sure we um, get the links for that or the contact where, where people can do that um, bef before we part here. One thing I'm wondering about since you've been in this you know, creative world of um, story creation and film and I guess where do you see things going over the next years? Yeah, uh, it's a fun question. I was actually um, – I was just interviewed in an article in Wired uh, that came out today that's, that was talking about the, the state of sketch comedy and the future of sketch comedy. Um, and it's based on recently uh, this, this comedian, and he's a friend of mine, Matt Kleinman, had an article in Split Cider, which is a humor uh, news site. And he was making the claim that sketch comedy is kind of on a decline online. And he, he was blaming Facebook and um, the algorithms that tend to favor lower production value, kind of more clickbaity, uh, able to churn out like uh, less, less thoughtful. You can kind of passively watch with the sound off and just have like a uh, word, you know, the captions float on screen at the expense of, you know, maybe longer form sketch comedy or more thoughtful, you know, things like a short film that you have to devote your full attention to. Uh, that just mm -hmm. doesn't do as well uh, online anymore because more and more people, instead of, instead of typing in a URL, like so instead of visiting funnierdie.com or another, the source of another content creator, more and more people just go to their social media feeds and they see what has been shared on there and you know facebook the algorithms and whatnot tend to favor uh the kind of you know the like junk food equivalent of of content hmm that's interesting it just seems to me that there's i mean the our desire as humans for good story yes I just don't see that going away. That's something that's part of us, and we, we continually seek that. So yeah. it seems like on some level we're going to still seek that. You're, I think you're absolutely right. And another – like a corollary to that argument that I was, I was just making is that instead of watching – and I kind of feel this personally. Like instead of watching, say, a five to ten minute you know, amateur sketch video on YouTube like I might have done in 2006 – now I can, on the same device, go to Netflix and watch a professionally made, extremely high quality, uh, you know, TV show or a good chunk of a TV show or a movie in a similar amount of time. And so it's like, well, why, I, I no longer need YouTube for my entertainment fulfillment. I can get hmm. for, you know, for free or for the subscri subscription service I already pay for. I can get a much higher quality. Uh, delivery on the same device. So that's another explanation for it too. Yeah, which I think would ag would agree with you that our desire for entertainment and specifically for storytelling is still there and not going away. Yeah, that's interesting. Hey, you mentioned that, you know, being a staff writer was one of those things um, down the road. Is that is that kind of, I guess, why on that? And is that kind of the pinnacle of being a good writer in comedy or, or I'm just very unfamiliar with the whole industry, you know, coming from an engineering background and now doing a little podcasting. Yeah, I think like the sort of the trajectory would be that you do your own thing, either stand up or sketch comedy or improv and, or these days, you know, like do well on Twitter, like have a have good jokes on Twitter, or get a following, something like that. Make your own web series. 
And then from that, I think you would hope to get hired as a what's called a staff writer. So it's not your idea for the TV show. You didn't sell the show, but you're one of the people that they come in to help uh, write the story of the show. Mm. Um, so that's that's like the next step. Uh, but then above that, the, the step above that, you would want to be the actual show creator um, or the showrunner uh, where you've actually sold the show and you're the one who's in charge of what the overall story is going to be. Um, so that would be like the the end, you know, the, the big goal or the big dream if you were a, if you were someone in comedy and sometimes people do leapfrog the staff writer step where if you like, um, Abby Jacobson and Alana Glazer had a web series called broad city, uh, that did well online and the, you know, the right people saw it and liked it. So they kind of leapfrog the staff writer step and they just went to selling their own show. Hmm. So that, that, okay. that can happen too. Yeah, I forgot who I was studying or listening to. I was listening to some one of the other professional or coaches talking about writing, and 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 they mentioned that yeah, some of the best writing going on right now is in this are, are in some of these series that are going on out there in terms of character development, in terms of you know these these um, I guess just good storytelling. I don't know what do you think about that, or or where do you see the best storytelling going on? Um, that's interesting. I. <laughs> I, without knowing specifically what he or she was talking about, I, I, I think the best is probably still being done by the pros. <laughs> like on, if you go to HBO or, uh, you know, the better stuff on Netflix, I still think that's the best. Um, I think TV right now, including the streaming services, I think has kind of su- supplanted movies for the time being, like for the best mm-hmm. longer term storytelling. And it makes sense because they have more time. It, it can be more like a novel with the amount of time that they devote to uh, developing characters, you know, like over the course of a whole season of TV. Like if you're listening to a, if you're listening to a book on tape, that might be the same number of hours as, as a whole TV show. Um, so it makes sense that that a movie wouldn't be able to compete with that. Yeah, now, I think that's why me was re- re- referring to like Game of Game of Thrones and those type of series that are going on now that are just have some really, really good writing, really good storytelling. Uh, yeah, I, I would, I would agree with that. Then, and is there anything else you want to hear about your book or about your current work before we, before we move on? Um, no, yeah, just not quite a genius is the book out now and new Q. That's a K N E W Q dot com. If you want to check out the app. Okay, we'll definitely do that. I guess as a, before we part here, uh, Nate, I'd like to hear maybe uh, a piece of advice for someone maybe earlier in their career um, in this creative work, maybe being a comedian or trying to, you know, create better stories. What would you say to that person? Yeah, I would say um, to do to do the thing that you feel passionate about, um, and to not try to do the thing that you think the people in power want, um, and to kind of think of it as a um, it's a symbiotic relationship. Like it's sometimes when you're starting off, it can feel adversarial. It can feel like you've got to trick the gatekeepers and they're trying to keep you down and that sort of thing. Um, but chances are they got into the entertainment field because they were passionate about creating art themselves and they want to make something good. Um, no one wants to make a bad movie, even though it happens sometimes it's cause it's, it's hard to make a movie, but everyone wants to make a good movie or a good TV show or publish a good book. And so if you're passionate, um, about your art, the people who are the ones signing the checks and the ones, you know, green lighting projects, they'll sense that. And it'll be refreshing for them to come across like true passion and someone who believes in what they're doing and they'll want to be a part of it. Um, so don't do the thing that you think other people want to do, uh, do what you want to do and do it as well as you can. And other people will, will recognize that and they'll want to help you succeed. Hmm. That's good. That's good. But now where, where you're at, when you create a story or write a story or the different forms that you do, I guess what makes that good story? And do you know that that one's good compared to maybe some of the other works you've done? Yeah, I think, um, I, for me, like if you're trying too hard, uh, if your story has too much artifice, like if it's trying to be cute or clever or trying too hard to be sentimental, um, 
that's a problem I run into a lot. And you know, it's, it's so subjective or it's such a fine line. Uh, hmm. but that's, that's something that I work on a lot is just ha- trying to be true, uh, true to life and not, um, letting my desire for the story to be really affected, affecting or really meaningful, you know, get in the way of that. And it's, it's tough. It's a balancing act. Yeah, that sounds interesting. How how you how you recognize that? Yeah, even. It, it, that probably take, comes with, with more and more practice. I imagine you're able to recognize that more. Yeah, exactly. Like anything. Well, Nate, I appreciate you spending time with us here and um, sharing a little bit about yourself and about your work. And you know, I'm excited to to learn more. And I might have to try this comedy thing too. And yeah, keep um, me posted. Let me know if you try to stand up. I think I have to. I have to push myself and, and go you do did. it. <laughs> All right. Uh, if people want to connect with you, is there a good place to go do that? Um, you mentioned your book already. We'll make sure we have a link for that. Yeah. I, you can contact me on my website, which is natedern.com. And I'm also on Twitter, at Nate Dern. Okay. Wonderful. We'll make sure we have those in the notes and on the website. So, Nate, thank you for spending time with us. Thanks, Jason. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you all so much for being here, for spending time with us on Story Hinge. We thank Nate Dern again for for coming on and sharing some of his his insights, some of his experience, and you know, I just in closing here a few thoughts. Uh, I guess the first thing I was that was coming across my mind is the the emphasis again on going for it, trying new things. Uh, you know, it reminded me of that that one saying where, in terms of your growth and personal development, if there's a an area you're most scared of, go towards that. And that's probably where you'll find a lot of growth. And I guess for me, that's talking to Nate and thinking about doing a, a stand-up. That's probably who I think I would be the most awkward in position for me to be in. And so uh, I've actually started looking at that and looking at uh, uh, putting a few uh, jokes together <laughs> and seeing how uh, taking a step towards that, let's say that much, and moving along those lines. You know, no, I guess another thing I would say about this interview is I feel like I was off my game a little bit. And Nate had some in- good insights, and I, I didn't dive into him as much as I w- would have liked. But I do. I did find some of his work really, really intriguing, and so I guess another thing there, just to remind you, uh, if you want to connect with Nate Dern, you can go to natedern.com. dot com. That's N A T E D E R N dot com. And I guess just in closing today, you know, I invite you to, as always, to continue to share the podcast, to subscribe, and and I invite you to go to the website uh, storyhinge dot com and go to the contacts page and we are inviting you to sign up for the newsletter and I'm looking for more ways, more ways to add value to your story and how do you get better story in your life. And I, as I mentioned before, we're going to be diving deeper into some story areas through that newsletter as an initial place. And that'll just be, you know, nothing, nothing spammy, but a monthly newsletter that's going to give you a deeper insight into story and for instance, this first month, we'll be sending out a newsletter about Aristotle's view on stories and story and what makes a good story. So it's going to be those type of things and some of the insights I, I've gained as I've, because, you know, you guys are hearing this podcast and it's, you know, it's, it's an interview and, and some, so a few thoughts for me at the end of that. But, you know, I actually spend a lot of time in reading books and studying story from uh, other story experts out there. Um, done a lot of analysis that way and. And I guess this is a way I'm looking to give you more insight. And actually, this first one, my brother's done a lot of the work on it. And he's brought up all that insight. So I'll also tap into some um, some of the resources for you out there to get better insights for you story creators and whatever form that might be. And also for us just to have better story in our life. So a few thoughts there. Uh, you guys have a great week. And we will catch you next week. Thank you for sharing with us at Story Hinge. We hope this time together has added more goodness to your journey. Until next time, onward and upward, and may your own story continue to grow more beautiful.